And then from there, I was helping a girlfriend out who owned a clothing boutique in Ellingsburg. Um, it was called Flirt. And so I kind of helped her with some marketing stuff, advertising stuff. And she had a location also in Pullman. So that was also kind of the avenue of I contributed my marketing and then um, also my love of clothes, which I've always loved clothes mm-hmm. and fashion. Um, but I was able to really learn a lot from her. <laughs> Hey, Islanders, and welcome to episode 151 of the Commando Voice. Today, I speak with the founder of Just James Boutique. Please welcome Jamie Solid. Hi, I'm Brandon Erickson, and you're listening to the Camino Voice podcast, where I interview local business owners, comedians, singers, and more. I dive into their backstory to find out how they got where they are, what are some of the tips for you to do the same, and find out where they are going. Tune in every week as I interview more of the people you see every day. Hey, Islanders, and welcome to another episode of the Camino Voice, where we release a new episode every Tuesday. Uh, Hope your guys' week is going well. Um, uh, We've got another week of sunshine that we got, so that's a a nice gift that we don't always get this time of year, so appreciate that. yeah, I'm still trying to come up with ideas for the uh, podcast to get a better um, schedule so that maybe once a month it's not a interview, but, um, or, or maybe it's a, like a, I've been thinking like maybe like a business catch up um, of like kind of an idea. I've, I've talked with some different business owners in the area of like the trends that they've seen this year um, and things like that. So I just wanted to kind of, um, you know, I'm still thinking that through. So if you guys have any ideas, remember, email me, voice at Um and uh, I'd love to hear from you. Anyways, today I interviewed Jamie Solid, um, <clears throat> which uh, I had, um, when I heard the last name, I was like, we used to have a, a gal that worked for us whose last name was Solid. Um, so yes, is a relation, uh, I think a niece to this person um, on her husband's side. So anyways, that was a fun connection just to get. Um, that gal was a great barista that worked for us as well. So that was fun. Anyways, um, Jamie, um, so there was a piece of this, uh, interview that after we cut the the record, um, she was like, oh man, I didn't get to talk about just James and what it means and, and what, why it's so important to me. And so I asked her, I should have recorded it, but I didn't. Um, so I'm going to paraphrase a little bit, but, um, what for her, just James is really a place that allows her to make somebody's day, uh, and, and share happiness with them. Um, she mentioned some of that in the podcast of just seeing someone transform, um, by putting on a new set of clothes and just trying something a little bit different. Um, and, um, really it aligned a lot with what we see as our mission here at the marketplace, of uh, bringing joy to the Camino Island community through food service and drink. Um, because she was mentioning how, you know, she helps these people that sometimes <clears throat> they come in and they're, you know, not, haven't had the best day and they're like, well, I'm just going to stop here to shop for a few minutes. Um, but she gets them to try on some new clothes that maybe they wouldn't have normally tried. Uh, and within a few, you know, within trying on some clothes and hanging out for a little bit, they start smiling a little bit more and, and turning their day around. And so that's really what um, she sees as her job within uh, or her mission within uh, Just James Boutique. Um, so I thought that was really cool. It really spoke to what we do here at the Marketplace. And so, um, yeah, plus it was really fun talking with her. Um, she has endured a lot. She's gone through a lot. She has a ton of experience and she's, uh, uh, worked with a lot of different startups of companies that ended up becoming very large companies. Um, so it's just funny how sometimes people's lives and their careers go. Um, and so, yeah. Um, but for those of you who don't know, uh, they've done a lot of work on the building, but just James boutique is located right next to Jimmy's or right across from, I believe union coffee, which is that new coffee stand, uh, in Stanwood, um, or crazy cross from, uh, I think it's Dos Realis. Um, anyways, it's right there. It's on the corner. It's a little bit tucked away, but they've added some signage, some paint. They, um, <clears throat> uh, but yeah, so that's where they're located. If you didn't know, now, you know, um, and of course we have the link to her website and all that. And that of course tells you how to get there. So, um, but anyways, had a great chat with Jamie. Um, 
And um, as always, learned a lot. And um, just, again, excited for all the new businesses and stuff that are here in Stanwood and Camino. Um, so without further ado, here is my conversation with Jamie Solid. Hey, Islanders, and welcome to another episode of the Camino Voice. Today, I'm here with the founder of Just James Boutique. Welcome to the podcast, Jamie Solid. Thank you so much, Brandon. Awesome. So before we get started, tell us a little bit about, about Jamie. Jamie, a.k.a. James. Um, Jamie, J-A-M-I, not Jammy or Jam-I, as everybody screws up for the years. Um, but yeah, I'm Jamie Solid, um, and not Solid. That's another script that people say. Um, yeah, I moved to Sandwood about, gosh, it's going on 10 years ago. Okay. Um, but a majority of my family, like um, my grandmother lived here, my aunt lived here, my brother is over on the Sandwood Bryant Road, so on Arlington. Um, but my cousins, you might have seen their um, vehicles of like Lens Enterprises or um, Lens Topsoil or okay. Taylor, Tayx, T- Taylor Trucking and Excavation. Those are all my relatives. Okay, very so, cool. Um, but I grew up in Cleelum in so central okay. Washington. Um, and I moved there when I was, gosh, I think, what was I, five or six. Um, my family bought a farm over there. Um, we moved from Linwood to Cleelum. Wow, and, that's a change. Uh, yeah. Um, <laughs> it wasn't a huge, I mean, for me, because I was so young, it wasn't like a, you know, huge scary change. But for my sister, who is seven years older than me, she was uh, entering middle school. So it was a big change for her because wow. you've already have established friends and sports. And you go from, we went from a big school um, to <laughs> a very, very, very small town. Um, wow. I think Cleelum and Roslyn, they're all kind of like small little towns that kind of, kind of like um, Cleelum, or excuse me, Camino and Sam would have the, the two towns kind of married together, you know, yeah. they're, kind of, they're kind of cousins. Um, that's how Cleelum and Roslyn and South Cleelum are. Um, it's like three little communities, um, all related. And so, but all together it was like 3,000, 4,000 people. So wow. very small, big change. Yeah. But I'll tell you what, though, I met um, my bestest friends, and um, because growing up in a little little country um, town on a 50-acre ranch um, with some farming roots, <laughs> I think I established so much of uh, who I am today because of growing up there, and those friends that I met at first grade are my best friends today. So, nice. So, Yeah. Very cool. So was that something that your parents had always wanted to have as a farm, and so they just found one and moved? Okay, so um, I guess so much of, like, why I own a business today. My dad owned a excavation company, and mm-hmm. it was located over here on the on the west side. Yeah. And he actually commuted um, every single day from Cleelum to wherever the job, the excavation job could wow. be. Um, and so, but he loved Cleelum. He, my grandmother, my grandparents who lived here actually in Stanwood, um, they used to go to Cleelum hunting. And so they okay. would bring my mom and dad. And they loved it over there. They loved the slower pace, the um, really small community, um, the country lifestyle. And so they wanted to really kind of raise us kids over there. Yeah. Um, though there is no jobs really over there, so therefore you have to kind of commute. Um, but so um, they just loved it. They loved where I grew up was called the Tianway Valley. And it's really a breathtaking little beautiful banana belt little valley. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. Very cool. So did you guys have like go everywhere when it came to the farming, like animals, you know, growing yeah. stuff? Yeah. Yeah, my dad is 74 years old. Even though he's retired, he's still a hay farmer. This guy <laughs> will not turn off retirement. He um, he should be just like traveling everywhere, but he is a farmer. Um, so he sells hay. We um, have horses. Never got into like cows or pigs or anything. Wanted them, but um, had a really wild rabbit once that bit my lip. So I'll have a scar to this day. But that was the extent <laughs> of our farming. Just a lot of dogs and a lot of horses. I think we had like, oh gosh. I, at, at most 13 horses and we're just wow. trail riding people in fact yeah. they kind of became pets okay yeah very cool nice so then um you went to high school and everything over there um <clears throat> so as you were going through high school what were things that you were kind of looking at were you thinking that you would stay in Cleelum or were you always looking to elsewhere Okay, so I graduated um, Y2K, year 2000. Nice. Um, didn't know the, you know, what was going to happen at New Year's when it struck for 2000, but um, we're still here. Um, <laughs> honestly, I 
was a little bit, I didn't know what I was going to do. Um, my mother had passed away when I was 15. Mm. Um, and all my siblings, I'm a, um, the youngest of four. Okay. And my siblings are, um, gosh, anywhere from 7, 10, and I think 12 years older than me. Okay. Um, so I was kind of the only child. And um, I was a little bit scared to leave my dad, even though he had remarried and life had moved on and he had built a new home on our farm. I was a little bit um, just scared what to do and leave him, and I don't know why. Um, he's my best friend, and I don't even know why. But um, I went to college. I went to Central Washington University, oh, yeah. so I stayed relatively close. Um, you know, I kind of debated whether it was going to be the Wazoo or the or um, UW, which is where my friends either went there or Central, or you know, those were your three choices. I yep. felt like, and um, but I stayed local. Um, I also stayed local because I worked at a coffee roasting company. And so, and I kept kind of growing with the company as I was going through college. Mm -hmm. Um, I went from just like the barista to the, um, manager of the, you know, all the the staff. And then I went into, because it was, um, a roastery, I actually started, um, selling wholesale and all the equipment. So I went through college working for, um, Pioneer Coffee Roasting Company. Very cool. Yeah. And gosh, I was with them for eight years, I think, um, until I got recruited. I mean, I finished college with them. Um, until I got recruited by a little known resort called Sunkadia. Okay. Um, and so a lot of the executives and managers and GMs and, um, principals there were all my coffee customers. Yeah. And they were kind of were trying to recruit me, if you will. Mm -hmm. Um, whether I had the gift of gab because I was a barista or, you know, always trying to upsell or something. (laughs) Um, but they, um, they recruited me. So... Um, again, my direction for school, it kind of, when I went to college, I was like, I'm just going to get a business degree, marketing, communication, just something that was general. Yeah. Um, I really kind of didn't know, um, because I felt like my inspiration was constantly changing as I met people through, um, kind of the coffee shop, meeting so many people. Yeah. I was inspired, yeah. you know? Um, but it wasn't until really working for Sunkadia did um, did my love and drive for whether it was marketing and business and sales really kind of like foster. Yeah, very cool. So then, um, what was your position when you started with Sunkadia then? Yeah, so um, Stuart Hicks, he was. Um, so, are you familiar with Sunkadia? No. Okay. I'm not. Gosh, beautiful place. Um, so, Sunkadia is really a destination resort that is, oh my gosh, I'm going to give the sales pitch. It's only 80 miles away from uh, Seattle. And so, <laughs> it was just, you know, this development that um, was far enough from Seattle um, that you felt like you were far enough away, but yeah. yet you're like, oh gosh, I could leave in the morning and still make my morning commute. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, so, Stuart, that we were building the lodge, which is a condo hotel. So, okay. um, people would buy the hotel rooms, essentially. Um, and they could um, put it into the rental property program, or they could just own it outright. They, okay. And so he recruited me for a um, sales assistant position. So just be a sales assistant to all of the salespeople there. Also, I was actually the only local person that really worked on the sales team. Okay. And so um, the rest of these salespeople literally came from all across the United States. I mean, one of my dear friends today, she's from Florida. Okay. And um, they just are top of their game sales agents. I mean, they are the selling sunset of destination properties um, of agents. So I was their assistant, and it was such an awesome time. Gosh, this was probably 2004, 2005. Okay. Okay. Um, when I started working there and, um, I'd never been in a helicopter at that point stage in my life. And I think I've been in one over a hundred times now. And okay. that is because <laughs> we would fly over the resort yeah. and like people could envision at what level they were going to be in the condominium. If at level four, this would be your view of across the river and the valley and, um, or you would go hover over what property yet you wanted to buy. I mean, it was phenomenal. And so I got to wear the cool headset and talk to people <laughs> And because I was local, I could, you know, just point out all the, like, landmarks and mountains and valleys and what animal they were looking at, you know. It was, yeah. it was really cool. Um, and so a sales assistant. And But ultimately, I'll shoot you straight. 
being a real estate agent was definitely, a, and it still is, it's, I think, probably one of the scariest jobs. I don't know why. <laughs> and I married a family into real estate. Uh, my husband's family is all real estate. Um, I don't, th- it, it scared me, and I didn't want to be an agent. My, I will say, my commission checks just being a real estate agent, though, or assistant, was phenomenal. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> I love those bonus checks. Um, but I had no, no drive to be an agent. Yeah. Um, but I really wanted to go into marketing because the gal who ran the marketing department, she was also a coffee customer of mine, and she was phenomenal. She was intelligent and beautiful and funny and witty and charismatic, and she was a director of marketing. And I was like, man, I want to work for her. Yeah. That's what I want to do. She was working with Sunset Magazine, Range Rover. Like, we're doing these commercials and all these advertisements. It's like, that's what I want to do. Yeah. I want to go into marketing. Okay. And so... Um, a, because it's a small community, B, because I promote with it within, um, and C, she was my friend. She really kind of took me under her wing. And so I eventually got into the marketing side yeah. at Suncadia and that was in 2008. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So because of the timeline, what was the kind of culture of Suncadia as you guys rolled into 2007, 2008 yeah. being in real estate? Yeah. Yeah, so obviously um, it was pre-recession, right? Um, so real estate was booming. Um, it was the first, um, Sun Kitty was the first of its kind, really of its dynamic, um, mm-hmm. of a really like five-star, two golf courses, private community, public community. It was, and because it was so close to Seattle and Kirkland and Redmond and all these major um, cities, um, people could buy their second homes or even a permanent home and still get to Seattle. So, so it was booming. However, it was um, it was new, right? There wasn't really much infrastructure. There wasn't too much entertainment outside of golf. Yeah. Um, so it was booming. Um, and then the market crashed, you know? And yeah. so it really kind of changed the course, like, oh, man, are we going to survive? And... Um, Marketing, to have marketing for a company is kind of like having a boat or an RV or a dirt bike. It's a recreational vehicle. We don't have to have them. It's a luxury. And so you're kind of the first one to get cut when um, Uh. crisis happens, um, when you got to make some budget cuts. And so the marketing department really, really dwindled. And my um, boss, um, Karen, she held on to me as long as she could. And um, I was getting married this particular year. It was 2009. Oh, <laughs> and oh. I remember we got called into an interview or a meeting, I should say. And uh, they were just like, hey, we got to make some budget cuts. And she was so sweet. She's like, I will take a cut in my salary because she needed someone. Because we literally went from like a large team down to two. And then it went to her. So that was 2009, um, and I was um, supposed to be getting married that summer. I mean, I had all like, and I thought it was just kept getting promoted. But I mean, there was just so many things just like slowed way down. Yeah. But I mean, obviously they made it through the recession, and they're the wonderful result, resort that they are. So nice, very cool. So during that time period, then, when you were working under her, what were some of the projects? What are some of the biggest things that you learned during that time? Gosh, um, how to pivot. Um, And I still use, I mean, we have to, you know, we're in retail and you have to pivot all the time. You have to get really, really creative. Um, You have to step outside your comfort zone. I remember one time uh, we would have these big, we had this huge Easter bunny, like Easter egg hunt. Um, We had the Easter bunny costume, but no person to go in the costume. (laughs) Um, In fact, he was nowhere to be found. And so... I was Sunny the Bunny that day. I was hopping. I was tossing eggs. And then I had to go sit in a five-hour, like, lunch, brunch, breakfast, um, and, like, hold adults and kids and criers on my lap to take pictures and not talk for five hours because the Easter Bunny doesn't talk. (laughs) And they'd probably be a little shocked to hear my voice to come out of the costume. (laughs) So I had this, like, heavy, saggy, oversized costume. I look like hip-hop. Sunny the bunny, <laughs> but um, you just have to roll the punches, and you you gotta learn how to take that punch and just kind of like fight back, but not fight back. You know, yeah. you, you don't get knocked down, you yeah. know, don't get discouraged, and just always have your game face on. That was the biggest thing. And man, it, it was such. I mean, to this day, outside of owning Jess James, the most influential, most 
foundational job, honestly, that I could have had with Suncadia. Yeah. Yeah. Very cool. Yeah. So where did you go after Suncadia then? Well, um, I got married. Um, and then after my honeymoon, actually, I got the call on my honeymoon. They called me back. And it was back to the real estate department. They're like, hey, or, um, excuse me, I'm totally lying. It was the HOA. Um, okay. So the, um, yep. Yeah. So anybody who bought a home, then there had kind of a design criteria, you know, you, you know, what the community is to look like. So the HOA actually brought me on board. I was like, sure, I need a job. I'm a new wife. We don't have much money, you know? Yep. And so I took it and um, kind of with hopes that like I could get back into the marketing department. And so I was there and um, sadly I was only married about three and a half months and uh, my husband had passed away. Oh my and uh, kind of wild time, so the recession's going on. Um, so recession hits, uh, lose my job, get married. My husband um, unfortunately had passed away, and um, but I was, son Katie was phenomenal, and so they worked with me, and so I worked with it. Um, I kind of took like a month or two off yeah. to kind of navigate those this new unexpected what I thought was going to be my forever. New you know, life, I, yeah. everything kind of turned upside down. But I went back to work in the HOA side of things and uh, was with them for, gosh, another, I would say, six months. And um, there was a homeowner at Tumble Creek, the private entity of Suncadia. Um, he was going to be opening a winery there. And it's okay. called Swiftwater Cellars. And he knew me based off the marketing department and sales department. And he's like, gosh, hey, Jamie, I'm going to be opening up this winery. I really, really want to recruit you to work for me. And I was like, gosh, let me think of it. Um, I honestly loved wine, but I knew nothing about wine. I couldn't <laughs> have told you what the difference between, like, a boxed wine and probably a Leonetti at the time. You know, I knew nothing. But I, it all went down the hatch the same. Um <laughs> But, uh, so I ended up working for him and okay. so another startup. So, I mean, my history of like being around like startup companies, I mean, whether it was Pioneer Coffee and then it was part of some kitty at the ground floor and then it was part of Swiftwater Cellars. So, um, and I, for there, I was his marketing director, his wine club director. And so that was such a rush of a time. Um, it was, we had like Lone Star there as our opening uh, the day our doors opened and we just had booked fabulous concerts and we sold out on the wine club before even anybody tasted a drop of the wine it was phenomenal we had an amazing winemaker makers I should say Um, the staff was phenomenal this beautiful beautiful venue Um, but if I'm shooting you completely straight because I was grieving the loss of my husband and I went I mean this winery just was full like people needed this winery um, during the procession, they needed entertainment. They needed fun. They needed a, an outlet and good food. And um, but it was it was such a crazy first year after my husband passed away. I kind of was like, whoa! I I I, I wasn't even grieving. I felt like, and yeah. so I kind of needed to step back and make some changes in my life. And so I went actually back just to Suncadia, um, it, uh, working on back to the real estate side of things. And okay. So, Honestly, I just worked, um, I was their assistant slash front desk person. So this was, again, what, what, gosh, 2010? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I just stayed in the community. And then from there, I was helping a girlfriend out who owned a clothing boutique in Ellensburg. Um, It was called Flirt. And so I kind of helped her with some marketing stuff, advertising stuff. And she had a location also in Pullman. So that was also kind of the avenue of, I contributed my marketing and then um also my love of clothes which I've always loved clothes mm-hmm. and fashion um but I was able to really learn a lot from her going to the buying shows and you know kind of reading trends and forecasting and just kind of getting to know people's style and identity yeah um so gosh went from there to helping her uh Sankedia, helping her um and then how did it get me? Oh, it got me to Seattle. Okay. <laughs> Life is wild. Um, <laughs> I decided I wanted to move out of Cleelum and move out of the home that my husband and I had. I just kind of needed to push my comfort zone yeah. and uh, leave the house of grief, if you will. And so 
I left Small Town Clam and I threw my resume out to what felt like 200 companies. And because, again, nobody was hiring marketing still during the recession. Because it was, it was a while. It was several years, yeah, you know? Yeah, yeah. Um, I got a call for an interview at a structural engineer firm. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Totally outside my comfort zone. I couldn't even tell you at the time what an engineer exactly did. Um, I knew they were really smart and um, didn't even know if they could handle a personality like mine. <laughs> um, but I had a little bit of the construction background with excavation and dirt work, so I knew a little bit of knowledge. But I also knew it was a quick study, and um, I kind of loved to be challenged and yeah. really loved to learn. And so um, got a job with DCI Engineers in downtown Seattle. Okay. Yeah, and that was in 2012. Okay. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. So how was how did that go then? Getting start with them learning that field and. Gosh, um, the hardest and mis- most rewarding outside of parenting um, job I've ever had. Oh gosh, I literally knew nothing about engineering. I didn't understand a word that even came out of the engineer's mouth. I was like, <laughs> these people are so intelligent, and. Um, um, my boss, Amy, uh, actually, I should back up the, I went through two interviews, and I remember my first interview, I was like, oh, yeah, home run. Get called the second interview. And, um, and keep in mind, I'm a, I barely drove into the city, so I didn't even, I was constantly lost on a one-way street. I was that annoying driver that you see, and you're like, get off the road. <laughs> um, but anyways, and at my second interview, I thought I bombed it. I remember I was just like, I, I knew I was doing terrible. I was like, I shut my portfolio. I was like, gosh, thank you for your time. I know I did really bad. I hope you find a really good candidate, you know? And I got in the elevator, and there was a janitor in the elevator. And I just started crying, and he handed me a tissue out of his <laughs> cart. And he's like, are you okay? I'm like, I totally failed at the interview. And uh, um, I got a call that night. And she's like, we loved you. And I was like, <clears throat> I was like, oh, my gosh. <laughs> okay, I'll take the job. And I started commuting from Cleelum to Seattle. Wow. Yeah. And uh, it was the scariest, outside of losing my husband, it was the scariest time of my life. I was, like, driving in the city, um, learning how to ride the uh, transit system. Um, bombed that my first week, too, because, um, A, it was really expensive to park. I mean, actually, then it was probably only $15 a day. Now I think it's, like, 50 probably <laughs> Feels like to it. park all day. Yeah. Um, but the coolest part was seeing the landscape of any city that we worked in change. Mm-hmm. And to learn about, you know, engineering really was the skeleton of a building and to see that like these people are so smart. These bu- people are creating buildings and, and infrastructure and roads to um, withstand any, you know, like environmental issue that comes aboard. Right. And so, I was amazed by these people. So challenging myself how to market for them and to really sell our services yeah. became like something of a fever I wanted to catch. I was just like, oh, I want this sickness. Like I want to share and be this, this contagion for this company because this company was so phenomenal. Yeah. And the, um, it was such a great wild time. And um, I kept growing with them and pr- getting promoted and... Um, Gosh, DCI at the time, when we first started, I think we had five offices, and by the time, and that was in 10 different states, and then we grew before I left at eight, the eight-year mark. Gosh, we had 13 offices in eight different states, and I was a marketing manager, and I oversaw the marketing for all of our different offices in different states, so a lot of traveling. I didn't honestly travel much prior, because I was just like, I felt like when I lived in Clown, it was just like job to job to job, yep. you know, and I wanted to work. Yeah. And I spent money, but not necessarily in travel, you know? Right. And so I got this opportunity to travel that I get, didn't get to do before. So it was phenomenal. Yeah. Yeah. And to see the landscape and the country evolve or to know what it's going to look like before the general public was really cool. Yeah. And so, yeah. Nice. Yeah. Very cool. So um, as you were kind of, uh, where did you end up going? How, I guess, um, what ended up prompting you to live, uh, leave DCI? Well, so in 2012, I um, decided I wanted to start dating again, and a guy by the name of Bjorn Solid, who I met when I was in high school at 16 years old, um, he was a high school crush of mine, 
um, when I met him. I met him shortly after my mother had passed away, and he's dear friends with my cousins that live here. Okay. And um, back in high school, zero fashion sense, I had braces, Coke bottle thick glasses, just this awkward girl, and I don't even think, when I met him, I was like, wow, this <laughs> guy is this tall, good-looking, tan athlete. He will never notice me. I and mean, honestly, you couldn't notice me because I, I felt like I was an eyesore. Um, but <laughs> no. Um, and this is pre-cell phones, pre, this was 1997. I mean, cell phones were there, but obviously not ever. you know, right. nine-year-olds or 15-year-olds d- definitely didn't have them then. <laughs> um, but anyways, we kept in touch um, from 16 till I was 32. And I started dating, and he happened to be single, and people had told him, gosh, Bjorn, Jamie um, is dating. And uh, he asked me out to be a date to a wedding in 2012, and he's been my date ever since. <laughs> um, and so eventually, when it was, um, I was working for DCI, but I moved from Clam to Stanwood. Mm-hmm. And, um, and then, gosh, we got m- married in 2014, Okay. And what prompted, I mean, DCI was phenomenal, but we wanted to start a family. Yeah. And uh, traveling and commute, that, the commute alone is yeah. wild. Yes. And Bjorn has kind of a busy career as well. So somebody, um, so for us to start a family, I mean, someone really needs to be here, you yeah. know, present. And so it wasn't until, gosh, we had our first child in 2016, our second child, uh, so our first one's Trigby, and he's almost six. Um, and then Cora came in 2018, and so she is almost four. But it was shortly after she was born, between the commuting and the traveling, yeah. I was like, this is really wild. Like, I was either late to the daycare, late at, uh, sitting in traffic. You know, it's always unpredictable how long yeah. I was going to be in traffic for. Yeah. Um, so I decided to stay home and give the little stay at mom, stay at home mom thing a try. Um, wasn't really my jam. Um, yeah. Staying home, I should say. Yeah. I'm too busy. Yeah. So, um, yeah, it was, it would be 20, 2019, I decided to be the stay at home mom. Yeah. Okay. Nice. Yeah. So then um, you're staying at home, probably at that, at some point you're starting to look for something to do, other opportunities, yeah. things like that. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. I, um, so, I was watching kind of like a lot of people probably were um, the food truck craze really was taking off in Seattle or Portland or like San Francisco, all these little major hub of cities, you would see all these food trucks. And um, as um, when we worked in this, when I worked for DCI, you didn't, I mean, you got your lunch breaks, but you worked through your lunch breaks. So often, like if you didn't have, if you didn't bring your own lunch, you would just find a food truck on the side of the road or on the side street or in an alley. So you go to the taco wagon or you had Thai food or, you know, you had such awesome mm-hmm. um, choices. So I thought it was kind of cool. I was like, man, these people are so um, smart because they don't have the overhead of a building and the staff, you know, and like, yet they have a rush of fast fast cash really you know um and so I remember going to this one um kind of a a market if you will kind of like a farmer's market in Monroe and there was um this gal who had a converted U-Haul truck but it was closed so she was the clothes of a food truck you know yeah she was this really cool gal and she quit her full-time job to run this um clothing truck, if you will. And she would go do, she would go to UW, she would go to all these different, like, and just park and sell clothes and, like, just hustle clothes. And I was like, oh, gosh, what an amazing car. And she left her job at a bank that she had for, like, 10 years to do this. Like, she had an established income in retirement, and she just threw it all in for this yeah. U-Haul clothing truck. And I was like, gosh, that's so wild. And I remember telling my husband about it. And so, at this time, this was probably 2015. And um, he thought it was silly and ridiculous. And I was like, gosh, I think it's kind of bold and brave and so cool (laughs) and unique. And um, so I kind of always daydreamed about that concept because I always liked clothes. I love fashion and what it can say for someone um, and how it can just transform you. You can wear a different outfit every day and be kind of someone different Mm -hmm. um, if you wanted to. Um, Anyway, so I always kind of kept this idea of this clothing food truck idea and um, I had this 
logo that I drafted up on my then DCI laptop. It was called Just James Boutique. And so I just always kind of, every time I got a new laptop, I would just transfer the files over to my new <laughs> laptop and maybe email it to our laptop at home. And, and it wasn't until I was a stay-at-home mom, I just, um, and really being able to enjoy Stanwood, because before I felt like, because I was commuting every day, yep. I didn't get to enjoy the community. Right. I was like, honestly, I was in Seattle or wherever city I was at, yep. you know? And um, I was home, and I was like, well, maybe I'll just do, like, to try to like have my own cash and my own because I, I always had my own cash it was hard for me to for, even though we're married we have a joint yes. income it was hard to like kind of give up the control that I had yeah. or I felt I don't know and it felt weird for me to be a stay at home mom and just like oh honey I'm gonna go shopping today is that okay that I just dropped a little bit of money you know right um, yeah. but I just wanted something for myself I liked having my own responsibility um, and something to challenge myself and uh yeah, it wasn't until um, my husband was really kind of on board with me doing something. You know, he's like, yeah, do, do something. You know, if you really feel like, you know, you want to do something, he, he really challenged me and championed me to go do whatever I wanted. And so I started looking for cargo trailers, and I found one. And we were getting the ball rolling. I was just going to do little mobile pop-up boutiques, whether at a business or a friend's house. And um, But then COVID happened, and so yeah. that was what? That was, what year was that? 2020. 2020, yeah. Yeah. So things, that idea kind of was like tabled a little bit. So um, where did the name Just James Boutique come from? Yep. So name is Jamie. My dad's name is Jim, James. Um, I think they thought it was, um, I think this is pre-ultrasounds, but I think they thought it was going to be a boy. So either they thought. Either I was going to be a James Jr. or Benjamin or something, but um, they named me Jamie. They're like, oh, we're having a girl. Um, <laughs> so I'm Jamie, but honestly, it's just a nickname. Like, it was like, you know, people call me Jame, Jamers, Jameson, James Qua. But, I mean, everybody called me James. Okay. And so it was just my mother-in-law calls me James. And it was before she, like, I, we, I even knew she was going to be my mother. Everyone calls me James. Okay. So, um... I just went by just James, you know, I mean, it was just, it was just a nickname. Yeah. 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 Very cool. So then obviously the pandemic hits and that throws everything into the air. Um, when did you kind of re-pick up the idea then? Well, yeah, I honestly, so then like shopping just came to a halt and I think we did everything online and, um, I decided I didn't. I've had things knock me down before. I wasn't going to let little COVID knock me down. I also thought it was supposed to be like only a month long cold. (laughs) I was like, oh, we'll be fine. You know? And so I just kept moving forward. I was getting my website going. I started buying inventory. I was getting our trailer fully outfitted. And I just kept going forward because I've had like life things knock you down. And I was like, it's not, I I didn't choose to look at it that it was going to be a forever thing. It felt forever. Um, but um, I my very first show um, was at Bertelson Winery, and that was June 22nd of 2020. Okay. And they hosted a ladies' night. And I would say just James totally evolved and took off from that moment on. Okay. And literally the next day, I remember just bawling of gratefulness that night, driving home, hauling my trailer, and I was just like watery mascara eyes. I mean, I looked like I was at a, like a lead singer of Kiss with just all the mascara <laughs> all over my face, and I was just crying, drive, hauling my trailer home, telling my husband, I'm like, I sold practically all the inventory. And I was like, maybe this will work, you know, maybe this little mobile concept because nobody couldn't go, nobody was allowed to go into the Targets or the Nordstrom's or any department store for that matter because they weren't of a necessity. Yeah. And then that concept of, great, we just, they, we just had a pop up, then that was considered kind of a no, no. So I was like, and so it kind of slowed me down again. Well, then women decided they wanted to host me at their house, and they were like, we'll keep our distance. We'll have kind of a sip and see. We'll host wine and appetizers and individual little things. Um, And women kept their distance, and I would allow one woman in the trailer at a time. (laughs) And and if you were the first one, that was the key, because you didn't want to be the last one, because somebody else is going to get your stuff. 
um, they were wild. So I did all these mobile little pop-ups at women's homes, like a lot. Like, so I opened in June, I think I did 17 little mobile pop-ups at whether various locations of people's homes and businesses in six months. And, nice. um, but, um, two months after having my first pop-up, um, I decided to have open a brick and mortar. I was like, let's just give it a go. You know, I'll abide by the rules. And so we are now located at our location today, which is formerly known as Poppy Seeds that everybody knows or right next to Jimmy's or Cookie Mill or, you know. Yeah. So, yeah, that's where we're at. Awesome. Started mobile and went brick and mortar. Nice. So when, when did you guys actually move into that location then? Yeah. So our grand opening was August 20th um, or, or I'm sorry, August 23rd of 2020. And um, my tenant, my landlords are really, really cool. They're my in laws. <laughs> um, and they had this building that kind of was sitting vacant because their previous tenant, um, because of COVID, they're like, well, this isn't going to work. So their plan shifted. So it just sat vacant. And honestly, I was just going to use the home or the, because uh, it looks like a house, um, the, the building for just a staging ground for all of my inventory. Okay. Because all the inventory gets shipped to my house. And I have two young kids. And <laughs> and they think it's Christmas every day for them. They want uh-huh. it, and um, they've got dirty hands. Open the boxes. <laughs> open the boxes. Um, they imagine. drag everything out. They try everything on. Oh, yeah. The amount of times I've tried selling something and it's stained because of my daughter, I'm like, cool, great. The whole concept of you break it, you buy it. I feel like my kids stain it. I still own it. I buy it. They still own it. Um, anyway, so we, um, I just had the intention of, uh, just staging the clothes there, maybe doing some shots, website stuff. And then um, my father-in-law and my, my husband, we were in the building just talking about, like, the walls and the rooms we'll paint and move around. They're like, just open up a location. So I opened up with the intent of only being open three days a week because I still, my job as a mom, I still really want to be present. And um, I didn't want the, because owning a business, I assumed, is really full-time. It really never turns off. And it also kind of scared me. Um, for the same um, way that a real estate agent kind of scares me. Um, <laughs> but it, again, challenged me. It drove me. And, man, I couldn't love it anymore. I mean, it, it still scares me. <laughs> and it drives me crazy. But, yes. um, yeah, so we've been there now a uh, little over two years. Very cool. Yeah. yeah. Awesome. So then, um, <clears throat> so in that then, do you guys still do the mobile pop-ups at different events? Yep, yep, <clears throat> um, we do. We go to um, probably not as many. Um, it's myself and I have um, another employee that works the store, and then I do all the mobile pop-ups, but I go, gosh, it feels like I go everywhere in the state, um, whether it's a business, um, primarily businesses. Every, I still do homes, um, but I, I kind of, now that I juggle both the website and the social media and being a mom and the business, I kind of have to pick and choose and cherry pick what shows I go to just yeah. because um it's hard to, I mean I want to say yes to everything but we're only I'm only one person right. and so but yeah I am um, predominantly in here kind of in uh, Snohomish and Skagit County um but I go to eastern Washington quite a bit too and actually down um I go to Tacoma quite, quite a bit as well in Puyallup so okay. yeah I'm kind of everywhere I try to do only for before I did like seven in my first couple years I did like 17 shows and a half a year, I do about 17 all together in a year. Okay. So um, not as many, but still, you know, one to two a month. Yeah. 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 Very cool. So, um, so what have been kind of the, the biggest challenges and stuff you faced upon opening yeah. since you opened the brick and mortar? Yeah. Well, you know, my biggest thing was, um, I, the, the biggest challenge is still to try to be, um, you're a small business, small town, um, and being a mom, you know, yeah. and so trying to juggle those elements, um, and coming out of COVID, you know, there's still a lot of people leery, um, tourism really started picking back up or, you know, we're kind of a, we're a seasonal community where our summers are really, really hot here, right? Yep. Everyone comes to Camino and like, uh, so, but for, you know, for Stanwood, we're, I guess in Cleelum, you had I-90, right? People could get on and off the freeway, no problem. We had this destination, and, I mean, you could get on the freeway and off the freeway in a minute. We're in trying to draw people to get off the freeway to come to Sandwater Camino is a little bit more trickier. Yeah. 
Um, and when people, and there's the residents here, um, I don't know if you've sat in the traffic between San Juan Camino. <laughs> it is, um, and I feel like I'm right at that sweet little intersection, which is really hard to pull out. Um, and so trying to get people to like kind of honestly pull in sometimes because yeah. they're like, gosh, they just sat in their long, that... On the, From I five all the way through. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so there's this challenge of you know, um, kind of I feel like kind of still being noticed and being relevant and being heard. And people don't know me yet. You know, I'm still new and still young. Um, and but then juggling how to manage a business while being a mom. You know, yeah. and so those are the juggles and struggles. Um, but I'll tell you, the good from it is. And the whole reason why I opened is um, is making people feel good. Yeah. You know, I carry men's clothes and women's clothes and home decor, um, but I love making people feel good and just smile. I love that whether it's an outfit you put on or they're or picking out a gift for someone. I or maybe they buy nothing that day, but I just want to like see someone just have a conversation and talk to them and get to know them and make them laugh ultimately because I just love to laugh. Um, that has been the highlight. And so you kind of kind of overweighs the you know the hard times and the struggle of owning a retail business. Yeah. Yeah. Are you guys still open just 3 days a week then? No, we moved so we're uh, open 5. So we're open Tuesday through Saturday. Okay. Um, yeah, we Tuesday through Friday we open at 11 and close at 5 and then Saturdays we're open 10 to 5. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Very cool. Yeah. Um, so a question I have so this is um, when it comes to like fashion and stuff like that, and especially when you're dealing with either small town or, um, you know, you're not, we're not living in New York or Seattle, stuff like that. Yeah. How do you kind of gauge that as far as fashion trends and stuff like that? How do you kind of stay on top of all that? Yeah. You know, so much of it. And today is wild. I mean, <laughs> it is, I feel like you can see, I mean, it's just wild. It's, you know. The times have evolved so much, but the fun part about being a boutique owner or a clothing owner, store owner, is that you actually buy several seasons ahead of the current season you're in. So you'll see what they have out, and you're like, oh, okay, this is what's going to be, what, what we're going to be wearing in six months. And so um, I try to keep trendy, but um, also stuff that is... Um, I mean, keep relevant, but nothing that will go out of style just next year. Or, right. you know what I mean? I, I feel like I carry classic, affordable pieces and trendy pieces. I also love to make people kind of put out, push their comfort zone. Like, they might be just used to a good old turtleneck. I'm like, let's show a little skin of the shoulders, you know? Like, <laughs> I like seeing people um, step outside their comfort zone with clothes because you can just see, like, oh, wow, this confidence come out of them and their personality comes out. Um, but watching trends can be from just from TV shows and magazines, which I'll be perfectly honest. Uh, we canceled our Dish Network years ago, but I mean, there's Netflix and all that stuff. But I mean, just seeing what people are wearing out and about, yeah. just watching people. I mean, yeah. that's probably, that's been my job. I think it started as a, mar uh, a barista. You watch people. Yeah. You know, you watch them from when they walk in, I was like, oh, is that a mocha guy or is that an Americano guy? You just watch people. Yeah. And that's all marketing trends is just watching. Yeah. 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 Well, I think it's it's entertaining. My wife and I talk about this, that um, we've seen a lot of the 90s trends kind of start coming back oh, through. Oh, yeah. And it's funny. There's some that have come through where you're like, I, I thought that was dead and buried. Gosh, I why is it coming back? <laughs> like low-rise jeans. No, we shouldn't go back to that. <laughs> For several reasons. And as a girl, I can tell you one of them. Yeah. Um, yeah. It is very the 90s, which, don't get me wrong, I loved my 90s music. Yes. And I love, I mean, we're still wearing those graphic. I mean, I have original graphic, like from the actual concerts, those graphic <laughs> tees, you know, band tees. And now nice. kids, they wear them. They've never, they don't even know who the, ba the lead singers are. I'm like, come right. on, you know, but whatever. You know, I'm selling them, so come, come, come buy, buy them from me. But, um... <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it went from, I mean, I remember wearing the, the baggy jeans with a little bit of a crop top with the flan. I mean, very, it was Seattle grunge era, and, mm -hmm. you know, came back. It's funny how, it, I used to get embarrassed by some of the things my mom would wear, and she's like, oh, it'll come back, and boy, has it. Yeah, <laughs> that's a fun thing. I mean, history repeats itself, you yeah. know? And it just adds like a little new flair to it every time it kind of 
makes yeah, itself back yeah. around. It gets a little spicier, I feel like. Um, gosh, if you could see 90s Jamie versus uh, wearing the 90s clothes today, I feel like I'm, I'm a much more um, styled 90s girl. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's wild. Yeah. How have you seen, uh, what are, I guess, what are the big trends you see within men's fashion, stuff like that? Yeah, well, okay, so men's fashion in general here for Stanwood Kimeno is different from the, the men's fashion if you're going to say if you're going to head uh, more into the city. Um, you know, I, the, I tend to, my husband... Um, style improved when we started dating. Um, thank gosh. <laughs> um, but you know, the guys I the, the guy I shop for is kind of the everyday guy. He might be a little rugged, but he knows how to dress up. Um, but I would say men's fashion day. I mean, obviously we went. They went from a more straight leg, wide leg jean to a much more skinnier, um, fashion forward kind of guy. Um, I don't think that's necessarily all that you're going to find a lot of that guy here. And so I tend to sell clothes at my store for the guy that's um, a little bit more everyday, a little okay. bit more Pacific Northwesty. Um, uh, you know, the guy who's a little bit more outdoorsy, um, but yet who wants to go to Tapped or Bertelson Winery and still look just fine, you know? Yeah. Um, and, in fact, some of the brands I carry, it, it, one of the brands I called is called The Normal Brand. It's just kind of a normal, everyday, cool um, clothes that won't, um, it might not be the most stylish thing ever, but it won't probably won't ever go out of style. You yeah. know, it's not necessarily for trends, but it's just kind of a good everyday look. Yeah. Uh, so I tend to buy for the everyday look for the guy here. Um, it's just nothing overly trendy here. Yeah. yeah. Nice. Very cool. So then um, what do you see as the future of Just James Boutique? Gosh, um, I... I'm a dreamer, um, and I think most of us who own businesses are, you know. Um, you know, I'd love to see it uh, continue to evolve, maybe open up a second location where I grew up in Cleelum. I do a lot of shows there, oh, and cool. a lot of my online buyers or when people are like, hey, Jamie, for coming back <clears throat> home for the weekend, could you bring me some stuff? So maybe o open a second location there. Um, but so much of that is I feel like I'm – don't want to bite off more than I can chew, you yeah. know, yeah. Um, cause that's scary to say yes to things. And when you should have probably said no. And so I want to get just James where it is. Um, people know I'm here first and, um, I want to be able to really work with the community and the other local businesses. Um, I like to host a lot of events at my store. Um, often I, have an event where I showcase like a certain vendor just because I love championing other people and championing each other. And uh, so I would love to see it grow. I would love to see it, um, gosh, grow as not only just size, but yeah, and location. And, you know, maybe my the website will grow more. But I mean, gosh, so much of it is, I mean, I'm in kind of the the learning pains of um, being a, a first-time business owner or yeah. maybe any time it's like trying to juggle all of it, you mm -hmm. know. But um, just I would love to see its growth within the, the, the community and geography-wise, I'd love to open up more locations, yeah. Yeah, very cool. Yeah. Awesome. Well, I like to end every podcast with some rapid-fire questions. So the first one is, what purchase of $100 or less have you enjoyed the most in the last three months? Oh, gosh. Um, well, I probably, because um, I, everything I buy anymore is either for my kids or I just steal something off the shelves at my own store. <laughs> um, I would honestly say I'd, um, all the sunglasses, because what the heck? We've had so much sun lately. Yeah. The, Washington has been just spoiling us with its sun. So I've been just um, wearing all the different rotation of sunglasses lately because um, it's just been so beautiful and sunny lately. Yeah. yeah, I mean. Nice. Very cool. Who is the most influential person outside of your family in your life? Yeah, that would I'd go back to my Sunkadia days. My old boss at Sunkadia, Karen, she really... Um, like I said, she is just a cool, she was um, my first boss that was a female, um, and she had a, a position where, a position of power, and um, people listened to her and recognized her, and um, she 
could be heard and she was dynamic. And so she is still my mentor to this day. She wows me constantly. But gosh, you know, Brandon, if I'm being honest, man, I'm influenced every single day. Like I, I, I'll probably walk away and be like, oh man, that Brandon guy, like you'll inspire me. Like I am influenced by people all the time. Mm -hmm. I'm influenced by my kid. But if I just had to narrow it down, it'd be Karen. Very cool. All right. This is a fill in the blank question. I know this is weird, but I've always wanted to blank. (laughs) This is weird. Oh my gosh. Um, I don't think anybody knows this. Okay. I doubt my husband knows this. Um, Okay. Do you remember the show, the British show, um, Total Wipeout? Or it's like American Ninja Warrior. It's like the obstacle courses. Yes, yeah, yeah. I always love a good obstacle course. And maybe that's like my life. It's an obstacle course. <laughs> but yeah, there's, um, it's like American Ninja Warrior style. But it was total wipeout. Yes, and these, I remember that. And these people, oh man, they're getting <laughs> hurt. They're getting slammed. And I was like, I always wanted to know if I could do one of those courses without getting wiped out or knocked out. Like I just, I don't know. Yeah. It's just it's just a giant obstacle course. But I was the kid like who loved obstacle races in like elementary school. Yep. Loved those. But to do an adult big kid version. Nice. Yeah. That'd that be is fun. So weird. My husband's gonna listen to me like, wow, what a weirdo. <laughs> I think that'd be fun. <laughs> All right. <laughs> who is an interesting or fascinating person that I should interview next? Oh my gosh. I mean, first of all, how many podcasts have you done? You've done like over a hundred. You probably yeah. have already done this person. Um you know, someone that inspires me all the time and a resource to her because I think the beauty of being a small town business owner is building relationships with the other small town business owners as, as well. Yeah. And um, Bryn, who owns Vita Verde, have you interviewed her? I have, but uh, yeah. that was actually before she fully opened up her brick and mortar. She, so, But she's great. She is. She honestly blows me away with her strength and her outlook because, I mean, let me tell you, you will question yourself in being a business. You know, you're like, am I doing the right thing? Are people going to like me? Am I buying the right stuff? And you kind of cling on to hope a little bit. And then you then you get a, like, a window of, and, and, and a sprint of time where you're doing really, really well. Um, and so then it kind of carries on to the, to the hard times. But that gal, when you're... I resource to her all the time. And she is just a pillar of strength and grace. I, and I think what she's doing at her store is just phenomenal. Yeah. yeah. Very cool. All right. And lastly, what piece of advice would you give your 20-year-old self? Yeah. Um, you're going to get knocked down. It's okay to start over. Mm-hmm. You know? I, uh, and even when I had to start over at times in my life, I, you, get, you, got, you, get, you question yourself. You, um, you have to humble yourself. Um, you got to listen. And starting over is okay. You're, I honestly feel like you're never too old to start over. And I think that's when the magic happens is when you start over. Yeah. Because I think you just like, um, you learn stuff, you learn a character about yourself that maybe you didn't know existed. And I think that's what I love about um, owning your own business is that sometimes there's setbacks and you got to get back up and you got to challenge yourself. You got to pivot, you yeah. know? And um, yeah, to, it's okay to start over and it's okay to not know what you're going to do. And, yeah. um, there's going to be some major obstacles and I uh, just keep on, keep on going. Yep. Yeah. Very cool. Well, thank you so much for joining me on the podcast today. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Appreciate it. Yeah. It was great having you. All right. And Islanders, I will talk to you on the next one. Well, a big thank you to Jamie Solid for joining me on the podcast today. And thank you for listening. If you haven't already, be sure to rate, review, and subscribe to our podcast on your favorite podcast platform. It really helps us be found by other Islanders like yourself. And for more information on this episode, you can go to commandocommons.com slash podcast. That's commandocommons.com slash podcast. Thanks for listening and see you next time.